What if you had just two days left to live? And you knew it. Our minds perhaps go instantly to what we would do, who we would see, or what we would say. No time left for any grand adventures. No time left for a lavish vacation. The only time you have left is for the most important things in your life. Two days left to live. If you had just two days left to live and you knew it, and your family, your friends, your acquaintances knew it, you would find out how important you are to them. In the last two days of your life, you would know how much you are worth to them. The end of one's life is a way of bringing these things into a very clear focus. You prove once again what is most important to you, and you discover how much you are worth to others. If you had two days left to live, that's what would happen. We're in the beginning of the end of Jesus' life on earth. The biography of his life written by Matthew, inspired by the Holy Ghost so long ago, has been quite the journey for us among Emmanuel Baptist Church. Yet, we find ourselves over the next few months walking slowly, thoughtfully, and soberly through the accounts of Jesus' last days on planet earth. The first time. He's coming again. In fact, our text to begin the end brings us to the time in which he had just two days left to live. And we will see when it's all said and done, we will see what was so important to him. What was he passionate about? What were the most important things in the life of Jesus Christ? And we will see as well how important he was to others. What was his worth to his country? What was his worth to his friends? What was his worth to these men and women that he loved so very much? He spent the past three years pouring his life into them. What was he worth to them? And friend, follower of Jesus, guest, what is Jesus worth to you? Do you value Jesus the way pop culture does? Do you value Jesus the way the world at large does? Is Jesus only worth something to you as long as claiming to be a Christian gives you some advantage in this culture? Is there anything valuable in your life that you would willingly sacrifice to prove how much Jesus is worth to you? You may only have two days left to live. You don't know. And I don't know, do we? But if you knew that you would be dead by Wednesday morning of this week, what would the next two days tell you about how much Jesus is worth to you? Now, thankfully, after his life expired by the will of the Father, Jesus rose again from the dead. And he's alive, and because he is, we can live forever. And that's why this question is still so very relevant, because Jesus is still Still so very alive. I cannot get away from the Lord of heaven and earth. In Him we live and move and have our being. He gives us all life and breath and all things. He is the one with whom we have to do. What will you do with Jesus? What is Jesus worth to you? Today you get a look at four different groups of people or individuals who value Jesus in four different ways during His last days. Then as you look at these four different ways, Jesus was valued by real people like you and me. Let these serve as mirrors into your own heart and soul. What is Jesus worth to you? Now, we've already taken the time to read through the storyline of this occasion. We know in verse 2 that Jesus reminded his disciples of what they knew. The Passover feast was in two days. We also knew that Jesus reminded his disciples of what he told them would happen. He would be betrayed and crucified. I think this is the fourth time Matthew records him telling them that his betrayal and crucifixion was coming. And they didn't like that, but it was coming. 
We also know that about the time Jesus reminded his disciples about these things, the religious and political leaders of Jerusalem were meeting together in private at the high priest's palace to discuss a way in which they could arrest Jesus and kill him without causing a riot in Jerusalem at a feast. The text then records an instance in which an unnamed woman took an expensive box of fragrant ointment and lavishly poured it on Jesus' head while he sat at a meal. Her action was criticized by Jesus' disciples. Her action was also the catalyst, the straw that broke the camel's back, if you will, that prompted Judas to finally up and decide to sell Jesus out to the chief priests. Talk about a dramatic storyline. Talk about such opposite motivations, the love of Jesus versus the hate of the leaders. The sacrifice of this woman versus the selfishness of Judas. It's almost like Matthew arranged these things on purpose to help us begin to feel the full weight of all that went down during the last week of Jesus' life. This is weighty. And and let this too, I talk about, how could God allow suffering to happen? God is not a God who is disconnected from human suffering. He sent his son and he suffered. He's a God that is not aloof to your pain. Christ knows what suffering is. The Father knows what suffering is. This was real. It happened. Jesus came. He gave his life. He suffered for us. Do we understand the big picture of what's going on? So let's begin to look into these mirrors by spending time with our first group of people, the world. We gaze into the mirror and reflect on how the world values Jesus in verses 3 through 5. And when when we're talking about the world in the Bible, we are often referencing the world of people at large who reject Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We are talking about people who might pay lip service to wanting a Messiah, yet they hate Jesus Christ and everything about him. So number one, if you're filling in your blanks, Jesus is worth nothing to the world. Jesus is worth nothing to the world. The men who gathered together in verse 3, the chief priests, scribes, and elders of the people, these represented the chief men of the Jewish world. These were the leaders. These were the movers and the shakers. They were the religious and political heads. These were the men who had what power could be had as Jews under the oppressive Roman regime. If the Jews could have any power at all while under Roman domination, the power to be had was held by these men assembling in Caiaphas' castle. These were the official representatives of Israel, and they were plotting to kill Israel's hero. How ironic. Now, may I remind you, this was a long time in coming with these men. You go back and read the Gospel of Matthew, and you will see how the religious leaders of Israel were opposed to Jesus and even sought to destroy him every step of the way. In fact, they would have removed him from the scene a long time ago had it not been for God himself and his sovereign, perfect plan. God is in control of this thing and was from the beginning. Yet now, here these leaders are, scheming in secret against this famed figure in Israel. They didn't want to cause a riot among the people during the feast days. They didn't want to draw the attention of Rome, yet they didn't want Jesus to keep messing things up for them. And he really did. He called them out publicly for being wicked and poisonous as snakes and headed to hell. Go back and read his scathing public remarks in Matthew 23. And so naturally, they wanted Jesus dead. And they also wanted the status quo with Rome and the people to be maintained so they could keep their power, so they could keep their prestige, so they could keep their precious treasures. And isn't it interesting that they met to plot the murder of Israel's Messiah in the illustrious palace of the chief religious leader of Israel, Caiaphas, which was likely paid for generously and voluntarily by her devoted citizens. Do you know what Jesus was worth to the religious and political world of Jerusalem? Nothing. They didn't value him at all. They valued their power. They valued their position. 
They valued their prestige. They valued their pocketbooks. They valued their possessions. And Jesus was worth nothing to them. Let me ask you this. As a general rule, do you think the religious and political rulers of our world today are much different than the religious and political leaders of Jerusalem in Jesus' day? There might be some exceptions. There were exceptions in Jesus' day. Nicodemus and others. But does the world at large value Jesus Christ? Is he worth anything to the world? Or is the world more concerned with the status quo, the pride of life and the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh? They value their power and they value their prestige and they value their pocketbooks and they value their possessions. If Jesus hadn't come in the first century, but rather the 21st century, would the world at large and its leaders do much differently than they did back then? Frankly, Jesus is worth nothing to the world. You say, I disagree. Well, if he was worth something, the world at large would be repenting, believing his gospel, and thus solving its own problems by obeying his commands. Yet, the world continually proves itself, even as it is cloaked by religion and self-established morality, the world continually proves itself to be selfish and evil. And this proves Jesus is worth nothing to them. I, I'm just thinking about it. I just go to a Hindu dominant country and preach Christ. If they simply take your Christ and add him into the long list of gods that they worship, rather than turning away from their idols to serve the true and the living God, then you know how much Jesus is actually worth to them. Just go to materialistic America and preach Christ. Say, leave us out of this. No, sir. If, if they simply take your Christ in America and add him into their busy schedules as one more nice thing to do, one more religious novelty to make themselves feel better, rather than turning away from their idols of money. You say, we're talking about idols, not other things. We're talking about little Buddha statues. Americans, materialistic Americans have their own idols. And if they take your Christ and throw him into the mix and, oh, this might make feel better, rather than turning from their idols of money and career and power and entertainment and sex so they can serve they turn and serve the true and living God if you don't see them do that but just take your Jesus Adam in the bag wear a cross necklace get a tattoo and I'm not speaking against all these I'm just saying they just add them into the mix and become religious if if that's all they do but they don't turn to the true and living God then you know how much Jesus is actually worth to them Jesus is worth nothing to this world the majority had him killed in the first century. Even the common people who were shouting his praises when he entered Jerusalem were so swayed by the influence of the talking heads that they were screaming for his crucifixion a week later. So much for someone's religion making them right with God. Religious people killed the Son of God. Why? Jesus is worth nothing to the world. What in the world is worth more to you than Jesus? If your true values were clearly seen, would it become painfully obvious that Jesus means nothing to you? What do you really value? Money? Sex? Your job? Your status? What in the world is worth more to you than Jesus? So the Jewish world's leaders were plotting to secretly take Jesus and kill him. They had to do it the right way. They had to figure out how to pull it off just right. And that's when the opportunity they were looking for, fell, looking for fell right into their laps. What was the opportunity? Judas. Judas the traitor. Judas the disillusioned. Judas the man of wasted potential. The one who had every opportunity to love and follow Jesus. Judas, the one who everyone thought was totally on board with Jesus, yet everyone thought totally wrong. Judas, the one who loved himself and money and the opportunities that following Jesus afforded him, rather than loving Jesus Christ himself. Judas provided the wicked world leaders with the right up business proposition at the right time. He was a businessman. And everything was business with Judas, even the life of the one he claimed was his master. And he was so good at what he did that Jesus' disciples didn't even see it coming until it came. He tried to get all he wanted out of Jesus. See, number two, Jesus is only worth anything to a hypocrite as long as he gets what he wants out of him. 
Jesus is only worth anything to a hypocrite as long as he gets what he wants out of him. Following Jesus was exhilarating for Judas in the early stages. I mean, this was the Messiah, and Judas was thinking about the kingdom and the accompanying power, prestige, and riches that would come by being a close disciple of the king. Judas was the treasurer. He kept the money. He played the game. Yet he grew more and more disillusioned with Jesus as time went on, and Jesus kept saying ridiculous things like he's going to be betrayed and suffer and die, and ah, Judas just couldn't take it anymore. John chapter 12, a parallel account to the meal and the anointing of Jesus by this woman, it reveals that Judas was the most vocal in his criticism of her. He was so vocal about it, and John says not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief, and he carried the bag, the money for the group. He was a wolf in sheep's clothing. He didn't care about the poor. He just knew he had access to those funds if that woman would have just given him the alabaster box to do something with it. Yes, he claimed to be a disciple of Jesus. He appeared to be that and had all the disciples duped, yet he was no different than those wicked, money-loving, power-grubbing leaders of Israel. Jesus was only worth anything to him as long as he could get what he wanted out of him. And if he could not get that woman to, do to donate her very precious ointment to the cause of the poor so he could scrape the cream off the top and make out good, then in the very least, he could sell out Jesus and get away with something while he could. So he went to the chief priests. He made a cold business deal. And they promised him 30 pieces of silver, the price of a slave, in exchange for the Savior. They likely took money out of the same temple treasury from which they had been purchasing lambs for sacrifice that week. And they bought the betrayal of the Lamb of God. From that time forward, the traitor Judas eagerly for his, he sought eagerly for an opportunity to betray Jesus. See, Jesus is only worth anything to a hypocrite as long as he gets what he wants out of him. Sir, you claim to be a disciple of Jesus, and perhaps you have everybody else convinced that you are, but are you really a hypocrite? Are you playing a game? Are you wearing a mask? Are you just going along with everything because you want to get all you can out of Jesus and his church? Is your relationship to Jesus and his church a calculated business deal that will get you ahead socially or financially? How much you truly value Jesus will be revealed. It is only a matter of time. And if Jesus is only worth anything to you, as long as you are getting what you want out of him in this church, that's a scary place to be. You are not too far from being disillusioned with Jesus. You're not too far from making a deal with the devil. In fact, your greed for power, prestige, and money that may drive you to be a hypocrite and play the church game may eventually drive you to betray the very Savior and people you claim to love. You may find yourself going out and doing things people could have never expected you to do. Why? You don't value Jesus like you say you do. He's merely a rung on your ladder of worldly prestige. He's merely a way to keep your wife happy with you. He's merely a part of the path to your prosperity. Why are you really following Jesus? You need to understand that a hypocrite among the disciples is not isolated to the Bible. Hypocrites, people playing the game, appear to live the Christian life side by side by genuine saints. In fact, they can even seem good-natured and have good ideas, good reasons to criticize people like this woman who actually loved Jesus with all her heart. When hypocrites like this are among disciples, their mentalities can be like a cancer that spreads. They can be like leaven that leavens a loaf of bread. See, the other disciples, they were already struggling with what Jesus had been telling them again and again, that he would be betrayed and he'd suffer many things at the hands of the Jewish leaders and he'd be handed over to the Romans to be mocked and to be whipped and crucified. The disciples were already struggling with disillusionment and discouragement. They were already focused on earthly things way too much. They had a massive appetite for their own ideas about Christ and they were stuck in their own heads. So when Judas 
according to John 12, saw the woman anointing Jesus with this very costly ointment, he voiced what seemed to be a legitimate criticism. What a waste! This should have been sold and given to the poor. And the disciples, having no idea where Judas' heart really was, went right along with him and criticized this woman. Do you know that that revealed something about how they were really valuing Jesus in those days? Do you realize that their anger at this woman for doing what she did for Jesus revealed how much Jesus was actually worth to them? Why would she waste this, they said in, in verse 8 9. This could have been sold and given to the poor as if anything lavished on Jesus is a waste. See, number three, Jesus is worth little to his followers when they are stuck in their own heads. Jesus is worth little to his followers when they're stuck in their own heads. They were not thinking about the fact he's going to die. They were not thinking about the fact he would rise and he told them as much. They were only thinking about the stress and the pressure they felt because their master was saying things they did not want to accept. They were only thinking about the fact that their expectations of the Messiah and the kingdom were being dashed to pieces. Their hearts and minds were in turmoil because of Jesus. Following him was turning out to mean something much different than what they originally expected and they couldn't get unstuck out of their own heads. Yes, they seemed really spiritual as they criticized this woman for wasting this ointment. They even seemed socially minded with their complaint. But really, how spiritual is anyone who criticizes another follower of Jesus for worshiping him with all of their heart? Have you ever been angry at the actions of another follower, another follower of Jesus? What about recently? Have you criticized another disciple of Jesus lately? Maybe publicly, maybe privately. Did you seem to have a spiritual reason for it? If someone sacrifices to worship Jesus and you find fault with their worship to the point of criticizing them, your criticism, your criticism of them says more about you than it does them. You ever heard the old phrase, if someone starts talking about somebody else, it makes you think less. If they start talking bad about someone else, it makes you think less of the person they're talking about. And I'm messing it up. If they're talking bad about somebody else, it makes you think less of them than the person they're talking about. And this is, this is the case. Your criticism of someone else who's just genuinely trying to worship Jesus says a lot more about you than it does them. You know what it says about you? You're stuck in your own head. You don't value Jesus as much as you think you do. See, when we get stuck in our own heads with our own desires and our own expectations and our own dreams, we are easy prey for the spiritualized attitudes of hypocrites. When we get stuck in our own heads, Jesus is worth little to us. We prove that he's worth little to us by our attitude toward other Christians who are simply trying to serve him. See, when they are valuing him more than we are, we begin to resent them and get angry when they serve. They're valuing Jesus. We're not valuing Jesus as much. We feel that we get angry at them when we're the one with the problem. When we are apathetic about the circumstances. When we are fed up with the failed expectations, when we are done with the self-denial Jesus is calling us to do in a difficult season of life, when our love for Christ has grown cold, we very easily get upset and criticize others whose love for Christ is burning hot. What does your resentment and critical attitude toward others tell you about your love for Jesus right now? What does your anger toward somebody else tell you about how much you're actually loving Jesus right now? You know, it's not possible to love him. Or I'm, I'm sorry, it's not impossible to love him. It's not impossible to put away anger and a critical spirit. It's not impossible to realign my expectations and get out of my own head so that I am loving Christ. See, if anyone should have loved Christ for who he was and what he was about to do in a few days, it should have been the disciples. 
They knew how much Christ cared for them. They knew he wasn't a liar. They had some problems in their hearts, and their hearts were where they were by their choice. This woman's act of love for Christ proved Jesus could be worth whatever they wanted him to be. How much you value something ultimately depends on how much, you, how much value you are willing to place on it. How much someone is worth to you ultimately depends on how much worth you assign to them. To this woman, Jesus was worth everything. By her choice, Jesus was worth everything. In the parallel account of this woman's action in John 12, we find out that the woman was Mary, not Mary the mother of Jesus, not Mary Magdalene. It was Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus. And if you know anything about Mary, you know where you find her again and again and again in the Gospels. You know where you find her? At the feet of Jesus. Luke chapter 10, Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, they were having Jesus over for a meal. And Martha's super busy. I mean, super busy. She's being the super host and she's about to lose her mind. In fact, she criticizes Mary in that instance. And where's Mary? She's just sitting there. At Jesus' feet, not out of laziness, but out of love, listening to Jesus talk. Mary was criticized for choosing to sit at his feet. John chapter 11, Lazarus, her brother, got sick and died. And when Jesus finally showed up, Mary ran to him and fell at his feet in her agony and her suffering and her questions. And Jesus soon put her agony to rest and raised her brother from the dead. And the next chapter, John chapter 12, it's this very supper hosted by a former leper named Simon that Jesus healed this leper. And the people who love Jesus are all there. And Mary is overwhelmed by her love for him and all he has done for her and she understands what he has said about his coming death and she brings this expensive alabaster box filled with this very costly perfume and she poured it on his head in fact she poured it all out so that John 12 seems to indicate that it ran down to his feet and she wiped his feet with her hair she loved him she loved him by choice. He was worth everything to her. To Mary, there wasn't a place quite as sweet as falling in love at her master's feet. She had a track record of living for what was most important, regardless of what people thought of her. And Jesus made sure, we saw in verse 13, that her act of worship has been a memorial for her ever since that night. A memorial of how much Jesus was worth to a woman who loved him more than anything. See, number four, Jesus is worth everything to his followers who live for what is most important. Jesus is worth everything to his followers who live for what is most important. Are the poor important? Yes. Is feeding, clothing, and helping them important? Yes. Is, is helping and ministering to the sick and the needy important? Absolutely. But nothing is more important to a follower of Jesus than Jesus. And when we are thinking clear like, clearly, we realize that nothing and nobody is more important to us than our Savior. And when we realize that, it affects the way we live. And when we live for who is most important, then he is worth everything to us. Let the world have their power, their prestige, and their money. Let the hypocrites play their games. Let apathetic disciples criticize me. Jesus is worth everything. He's the most important. And no amount of sacrifice and no lavish act of worship that someone else criticizes because they're so spiritual. No gift that you give and no priceless treasure that you pour out. None of it is a waste when you are in love with Jesus. You love him. So he's worth everything to you. I read somewhere that this alabaster box of very precious ointment was worth about a year's salary. I make around 60000 a year. That's public information. If that's awkward, I'm sorry. I'm I'm a big dummy. But at this stage of life, I don't have that much in savings. We have an emergency fund. We have a Roth IRA. We're developing those things, trying to be wise with the resources. But I don't have, that, I don't have something worth an entire year's salary. I have a van worth $20,000 in my garage that a cat staying in our extended stay garage motel keeps scratching. Anybody want this cat? Looking for a good home. <laughs> my patience. 
It's wearing thin as the ice that will be melting this week. I'm just saying, I'm trying to imagine what it would be like to love Jesus so much that I'd be willing to take something worth that much and just pour it out. Think about your yearly salary or what it was if you're retired. Think about saving up that much money. If you're not in the height of your career, think about what the height of your career, the occupation you have, what the, 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 that amount would be. And think about why you'd save money like that. What, what do you value so much that you'd save that much money? You want to buy a boat? You want to buy a truck? A Tesla? You want to retire inspired? Do you want to go on some lavish vacations? And then think about how Jesus totally changed your life. And think about growing to love him so much that you want every waking second to be spent with him and you get a limited window to worship Jesus and you take it. And rather than spending your life savings on yourself, you pour out that very precious ointment on him. You know, last week I asked you, what is your five and two? You remember that? What's your five and two? Remember the five loaves and the two fishes that the disciples gave to Jesus and he multiplied them and fed 5,000 plus? Well, they, they gave him what they had. They gave him their five and two. And I asked you, what's your five and two? And you, would you be willing to give it to Jesus? Now I'm asking you, what is that very precious thing? And do you love Jesus more? In fact, would you give him that very precious thing if the opportunity presented itself. Is Jesus worth everything to you? I'm not asking you to drain your retirement savings so that we can support more missionaries than you're scratching your head. How are you going to take care of your wife? I'm not asking you to sell your 2024 Silverado. Don't know if anybody has that in here. It's just a shot in the dark. I'm not asking you to sell that and drive a clunker so you can have more money to invest in the lives of others for Jesus' sake. I am just asking you, is Jesus worth everything to you? And would you give up anything to worship Jesus? You say, yeah, I would, but let's be real. This was a very special occasion while Jesus was still on earth before he died. You might say, I might do something like that if Jesus was physically here. I mean, I, I might be something like that. I'd do something to minister to Jesus' body if his body was present. She poured this on his body. His body's not here. Can I ask you something? What does the New Testament teach us about the body of Christ now that he is in heaven? Isn't the church called the body of Christ? And wouldn't it be fair to say that you and I prove how much Jesus is worth to us by how we serve his body? Isn't it just as true that we have a very small window called life? to worship Jesus by serving his church. If Jesus is worth everything to you, wouldn't it make sense for you to pour out your life in service to his people? How else can you prove your love for the Savior you cannot see but by loving the people you can? Jesus is worth everything to his followers who live for what is most important, they live to love Jesus. They live to love the lost world and point them to Christ. They live to love one another. They gladly, even in their poverty, as we read in 2 Corinthians, they pour out their all to worship Jesus on a daily basis. Is Jesus worth everything to you? And what would motivate you to love him like this? What would inspire you in spite of the selfish world around us, in spite of the selfish facade of hypocrites, in spite of the selfish words of critics? What what would inspire you to so radically pour out your life in love and service to Jesus? Well, it all comes full circle to verse 2. Because in two days at the feast of the Passover, when thousands of lambs would be killed with their blood shed in remembrance of the time, God passed over the Israeli houses with lamb's blood on doorposts so he could judge Egypt and set his people free. When all those Passover lambs would be slain that week, Jesus would be killed. And his blood would be shed. And he would be the Lamb of God, giving his life as a ransom for the sins of his people, yea, the whole world. 
And he would save people from their sins by pouring out his own blood for them. He would willingly pour out everything and die for the sins of slaves, men and women, boys and girls who are slaves to the darkness and death of this world. And he did that so any of us who would turn from our sins and our own self-made salvation, any of you who will repent and believe, just trust what he did and receive his gift of love, any of you can be forgiven and set free from your slavery to sin and death. See, Jesus should be worth everything to you. You know why? You are worth everything to Jesus. He was rich, we read, Paul said. He was rich, yet because of his grace, for our sakes, he became poor. That we, through his poverty, might be rich. If you know Christ, you are eternally rich, and you are loved by a God who will never ever stop loving you. And anytime you question that, all you have to do is remind yourself of that cross. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You want to know why Jesus should be worth everything to us? We are worth everything to him.